about today? We're going to talk about chakras and mantras. And the quote for today's class is actually John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and because of Him all things were made. And we're going to see today, when we start exploring the connection between chakras and mantras, we're going to have a, a, look at, a different look at sound and how sound affects our bodies and how sound can create things. Because this is an interesting little quote because it's talking about the power of the creative verb. Basically, you know, God, creation, and sound being closely related to each other. We're going to look at that today as we study chakras and mantras. Now, when we talk about chakras, um, we'll go back a little bit and look at where they came from. They originated in Central Asian cultures. So if you're looking for the origin of chakras, this is where they came from. Chakra is basically a Sanskrit word, and it means wheel or circle. So if you enjoy the entomology of words like I do, where the root of things come from, the word chakra itself, it's just a, a Sanskrit word. Sanskrit was a, an ancient uh, um, Asian language, and it basically means wheel or circle. <clears throat> we can think of the chakras as centers of metaphysical or biophysical energy. Okay, think of them as little pathways for different types of energy in our body. And for right now, we'll just call the types of energy, we'll call them prana and kundalini. And we can basically think of them as life energy. Later on in the course, we'll talk more about prana, uh, prana and we'll get a lot more into kundalini. But for right now, we can just think of lots of different types of energy flowing through our body. Um, obviously, we have oxygen which flows through our body, we have blood which flows through our body, we have hormones and various fluids, and they all have channels in order to do that. Things like our, our veins and our arteries, for example. The chakras are thought of as centers of a typical or a type of energy. They can be thought of as centers of metaphysical and biophysical energy. They're centers of a different type of life energy, something other than things like our hormones and our blood and oxygen and that kind of stuff. There's all different kinds of channels and energies moving through our bodies, and the chakras are kind of like meeting places. They're like grand central stations for different types of energy in our body. When we look at the main chakras, we can see them or visualize them aligned in a column along the spine, from the base of the spine all the way to the top of the head. We can think of them as running up a straight line right across our back, from the very bottom of our spine all the way to the very top of our head. The chakras themselves, as we'll study today, when we look at each one individually, they have associations with different organs in our body. They have associations with different aspects of consciousness and they're often seen as the sources of occult powers or faculties, things like intuition, clairvoyance, that kind of thing. Now, when I use the term occult here, occult just means hidden, okay, or something that's not well known. So when we think of occult, it, oftentimes this can have a, many negative connotations. But you can think of occult the same thing you'd think of esoteric, or you could call it magical or whatever. Okay, so the chakras themselves, as we'll study today, are associated with different organs in our body, different levels of consciousness or awareness, and also different faculties, things like clairvoyance and intuition, are all intimately related with the chakras and their development. When we awaken or activate a particular chakra, it allows us to access atrophied states of consciousness or atrophied abilities that we have. Okay, when we look at abilities like intuition and clairvoyance, these are the things that all of humanity has the power to use. It's just we haven't used them in so long, we've basically forgotten. The mechanisms that allow these things to happen, they've atrophied. They've gone into almost like a dormant state. So the chakras we find in our body right now, they're in a dormant state. They're in an atrophied state. Part of the, the walking on the Gnostic path is the awakening of these chakras, developing them, allowing them to, to then uh, be used for various faculties and reaching various states of consciousness, levels of awareness, and that sort of thing. Okay, so we're thinking of the chakras just like energy centers in our body. And each energy center is associated with different organs, different levels of consciousness, and different faculties or abilities or, or powers, if you want to call them that. There's an interesting connection here. The seven chakras are the seven churches mentioned in the book of Revelation of St. John. If you have any background uh, in Christianity, if you've ever read the Revelation of St. John, it's a, a really interesting um, book to go and read. If you're not into reading the whole Bible, uh, Revelations is definitely something to read, just because there's all kinds of really powerful esoteric symbolism in that book. And after you've done a little couple bit or a couple weeks longer of Gnosis, you'll actually start to understand a lot of that symbolism. 
And in particular, we find seven churches mentioned in the Revelation of St. John. We find seven candlesticks. We find seven lights. These are all just different allegories for the chakras themselves. Okay, so when we talk about the different churches in, the, in Revelations, we're talking about the seven chakras in our own body. When we're talking about the, the, the uh, candlestick with seven lights on it, we're talking about the chakras in our own body. Uh, here's some various depictions of the chakras from different cultures. Some of these are really old, some of these are more modern. But this is what the chakras look like. We can find them aligned in a column from the tailbone all the way up our spine. And we can see here, as we can see here in this diagram. Okay, the idea of chakras, it's, it's very old, it's thousands of years old. Um, if you've studied the chakras before, there's lots of them. We're going to focus on the seven major ones. You can think of chakras as major ones and minor ones. There's seven major ones, and there's all kinds of lesser chakras found throughout various locations in the body. We're going to be focusing on the major ones here. Okay, and you can see the major ones are arranged in a column on the spine like that. And when you look at the, this particular depiction, they're drawn like flowers, okay? Because the sh chakras themselves are often referred to as lotuses, just like a flower is in its bud stage, and at the right time that flower opens and spreads apart, the chakras are seen like that. We have the beginning, the buds of these flowers, and part of our spiritual development is to allow those flowers to bloom, allow them to open up, and allow them to develop so we can start using the different states of consciousness, faculties, and abilities that come with each chakra. So that's why they're drawn like that here, because they're seen as flowers. And when we look at them, different chakras have different arrangements of petals around them. We'll talk about that later as well. So we can think of them starting right at the tailbone, the cosix, and aligning themselves on the spine until they reach the top of the head. <clears throat> Modern studies note the correlation and position of the chakras to the glands of the endocrine system and major nerve bundles. Okay, so there's a lot of parallels between the chakras themselves and glands of the endocrine system and major nerve bundles. Now, when we talk about the chakras, what we have to remember is we're not talking about physical things that exist in the human body. If you cut somebody open, you won't find chakras inside them. Okay? What you will find are organs and glands. The best way to think about the chakras are they're analogous to the organs and glands of the higher bodies. Your physical body is made of physical matter that belongs to this physical plane. Therefore, it has physical organs. For example, you have a heart. Your astral body, or your vital body, or your etheric body, it's not a physical body made of flesh and bone. It doesn't have a physical heart. It has a heart chakra. Okay? So the physical body has physical organs. The higher bodies have chakras. You can think of the chakras as the organs or the glands of your higher bodies, things like your astral body, your mental body, your etheric body. Okay, so the chakras themselves are not, you can't cut somebody open and find them. They're not physically in this body. This body, because it's a body of flesh and bone, has physical organs. The bodies that aren't of flesh and bone, they have chakras. Okay, so the best way to think of chakras, they're like organs of the higher bodies. Our physical body has organs that do very specific things that move very specific energies. For example, the heart obviously is responsible for circulation. It moves the energy of the blood through the body. That's its job. That's what it does as an energy center. The heart chakra in, say, the astral body or the mental body moves a different type of energy. So when people talk about chakras, oftentimes they're really confused as to, well, what is a chakra anyway? Think of them as the organs and the glands of the higher bodies. Okay? The endocrine system is what's responsible for all our hormones, right? That's the one that moves all our hormones around. We've got hormones that do everything from controlling various aspects of digestion to sexual hormones to hormones that make us grow, all kinds of stuff. We've got different hormones in our body at different stages of our development. The physical organs of this flesh and bone body moves hormones around. Okay? But in the higher bodies, we don't have hormones. We have different types of energy. And instead of glands and organs, we have the chakras. Okay, so the important thing to understand is to think of the chakras like the organs or glands of the higher bodies. 
The endocrine system are the glands that produce hormones that regulate body functions. Now, when modern science looks at chakras, they, you know, they say, well, there's nothing like that in the human body. You can cut a human body open and you will not see chakras. But what most um, people that study medicine have to agree with is there's a lot of correlations between the chakras and some significant organs or glands in our body. Okay, for example, the heart. We have a chakra that's associated with where our heart is, and that so happens to be where our heart is. We also have a chakra associated with our larynx right here. Well, that happens to be where our thyroid gland is, as an example. Okay, we have a chakra associated with the third eye. That just happens to be where our pineal gland is in our brain. Okay, so we don't have physical chakras, but there's some startling similarities between the ancient depiction of the chakras and some very important glands in the human body. The ancient people didn't know about the pituitary and how it worked and how it regulated hormones and that kind of stuff, or the pineal gland, but they knew there was a chakra there, and they knew that chakra was very important and did all kinds of different things. So we're going to see a lot of analogies today as we look at the chakras. Okay, so when we think of chakras, think of them as the glands or organs of our higher bodies, the bodies that aren't flesh and bone, the etheric body, for example, the astral body, the mental body, so on and so forth as we travel dimensionally. The first chakra we'll look at is the chakra Mudlahara. And this is the chakra that's found all the way at the bottom. This is the chakra that's at the base of our spine, our, our cosix, our tailbone. It's located between the sex organs and the rectum. So if you take a human body, go all the way to the bottom of the spine, the very tailbone, that's where we find this particular chakra. It's the one at the bottom. This chakra is interesting, uh, and we'll be studying more about the kundalini energy later on, but this chakra is interesting because there's a very special type of energy found here. Kundalini is related to the sexual forces, the creative energies. Okay, so the kundalini energy lies dormant in this chakra. Okay, so it sits all the way at the bottom, of the spinal column, a spinal column, spinal column, and there's a very interesting type of energy that's located there. And later on, we'll talk about the awakening of the kundalini, and that's probably a term that you've heard of. To awaken the kundalini is to work with an energy that we find in the chakra mudlahara, the one at the base of our spine. Because of that, this chakra nourishes all others with sexual energy. Remember when we talked about the five centers of the human machine? We talked about the intellectual center, the motor center, the emotional, the instinctive, and the sexual. We said the sexual center was like the nuclear reactor. It was the one that provided all the energy for the other centers to run. This chakra, because it's at the bottom, this is like, uh, this is like the, the, the engine that runs all the other chakras. This is the source of fuel for all the other chakras in our body. <coughs> to fully awaken the chakras, we have to develop the kundalini energy. We have to awaken the kundalini energy and allow that energy to activate each chakra as it travels up the spinal column. And we'll be talking a lot about that later on as well. It's often depicted as a four-petaled lotus. And this is kind of gets a little strange. Why, why are they talking about petals and flowers all of a sudden? When you look at this chakra in the higher dimensions, it kind of looks like uh, it has four points of light streaming out of it. Okay, or think of it as a light that seems to have four lobes. And you can imagine a light that kind of, you know, shone something like that. It's beaming light in four directions. So when the ancient people looked at the chakras in the higher dimensions, they say, hey, they kind of look like flowers, petals, and this one has four of them. This one radiates that light or that energy in four different directions. So it was always depicted as a four-petaled lotus, and that's usually how it's drawn, a circle with four petals around it. It's said that he who awakens the chakra can receive the elixir of long life and preserve the physical body for a really long time. We've all heard stories of you know, monks or Tibetan monks that have lived for, for hundreds of years. Even going back to the Bible, Moses himself was supposed to be, have lived for over 500 years, right? One of the reasons why we see people having the ability to, to sustain the physical body is because they're working with very special energies. They're working with energies that can awaken with these chakras. There are said to be masters on earth walking around right now that still have a physical body from thousands of years ago. These are masters that aren't obviously public, they're not walking around you know, making themselves known, but they're working with humanity, they're doing things to help humanity, and they've been around for a really long time. They've been able to preserve that physical body by proper use of the energies, and in particular, the energies that are contained within this chakra. Um, we've heard of people looking for the elixir of longevity, we've heard of people looking for the fountain of youth, 
Well, what we'll see later on when we examine this a bit further is the fountain of youth is something that's inside of us. It's not hidden in the jungle somewhere in the Amazon or something like that. The fountain of youth is describing energies that are lying dormant in our body. And when we work towards unlocking those energies, then we can do all kinds of different things, like preserve the physical body, and we'll see other things today. When we look at the book of Revelations, the chakra Mudalahara is the church of Ephesus. So if you get the opportunity sometime over the next week, um, read the book of Revelations, and every time we're talking about the church of Ephesus, we're talking about this particular chakra. We're talking about the chakra that contains the sexual energies. And it is said that in the church of Ephesus, we conquer the earth. Now, I don't mean we conquer the earth like rule the planet. I'm talking about conquering the element of earth, allowing us to gain uh, the knowledge of the earth elementals. Okay, so in the church of Ephesus, we conquer the earth. We conquer the earth elementals. And that's interesting because our physical body belongs to the earth, right? The whole concept, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, we're made from the earth, the physical matter, and eventually we return back to the earth. We return back to that physical matter. By developing the chakra Mudalahara, we're able to take control and knowledge of the earth element. Okay, of course you got the five elements, right? Fire, earth, air, water. It's also a fifth one we'll look at today as well. Okay, so properly developing Mudalahara gives us control over the element of earth and gives us a specific control over the physical body. We've all heard of yogis and, and all this these religious people that can do amazing feats with their physical body. Jesus himself walked on water. St. Francis of Assisi was capable of levitating. We know of uh, 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 yogis that can do strange things like can pierce themselves with all kinds of knives, bury themselves underwater, go you know months or years without eating. How do these people do these things, these so-called miracles? They're all just related with different faculties that lie dormant in all of our bodies. They figured out how to awaken these energies, they figured out how to properly work with these chakras, and it gives them the ability to perform what we would refer to as miracles or, or things that we don't understand, like levitation or being able to walk on water, as an example. Now, we'll talk a little bit about mantras later today as well, but each corresponding chakra has a sound that causes it to resonate. And this is a little bit of a cart before the horse thing, because I'm going to explain what mantras are later on. But the sound that is associated with this chakra is the sound S. Okay? And its color is silver. Now, if you've studied the chakras before, you're going to see some discrepancies in what I'm talking about with colors today. Um, when we talk about chakras, it's interesting because different bodies have different chakras. Different bodies have different colored chakras. And as we grow and develop spiritually, the chakras change color. The chakras, the colors I'm going to be talking about are the basic colors. Okay, the colors of the body that belong closest dimensionally to this physical body. In other words, the first chakras that we would awaken and the first points of our spiritual development. Okay, so if you studied colors before, you're like, well, I went somewhere and it wasn't this chakra it wasn't this color. They said it was that color. Well, you got to be specific when you talk chakras. Which body does it belong to, and which stage of development is it? because they change as we awaken them, and they change colors at different points of the development. So the colors in the astral body are different from the colors in the vital body, which are different from the colors in the mental body. Okay, so if you see some discrepancies with the colors, that's just because before perhaps they weren't making a distinction which particular level we were talking about. The level I'm talking about is the closest one to us, the first ones we would develop. And we'll see later on that we have to go through this process of developing chakras uh, a total of seven different times. Yes? So the uh, traditional colors that one's familiar with, the orange bit of mm -hmm. orange, yellow, green, mm -hmm. and so on, mm -hmm. would be uh, related to what... Uh, like, they're usually seen as the awakened ones, the, the final stages, when they're fully developed. So okay. that, that would be the goal that you're shooting for. These are the ones that they're going to be when you first start working with them, if you look at it that way. So the traditional chakras are the ones that are awakened and developed. The ones I'm talking about are the, the first stage of our development, the first step along the path. Um, so the mantra is the sound S, and the color related with the chakra is a silver color. And when I mean S, I'm talking about like tss, like the, the hissing of the serpent, okay? The sound a snake would make, which is why we'll see later on the Kundalini energy is often associated with serpents. And serpentine cultures, cultures that worshipped the serpent, were actually worshipping the Kundalini energy. 
worshiping this particular energy in our body. Um, it was Christianity that came along and said the serpent in the Bible was the depiction of the devil, so all snakes are bad. That was Christianity's version of saying, what do we do with all these ancient cultures that are worshiping serpents? Let's, let's make them bad. Just like the Christian depiction of the devil with horns and hooves, that was a stab against the uh, earlier Greek cultures that were worshiping the god Pan, the, the wilderness god, right? Um, interesting enough, in the Bible, there's two serpents. There's the tempting serpent in the Garden of Eden, which is seen as a negative one, but what a lot of people don't realize is the serpent appears somewhere else. The bronze serpent that Moses raised on the staff in the deserts, in the desert, sorry, that saved the Israelites. So there's the tempting serpent of the Garden of Eden, and there's the bronze serpent which saved the Israelites in the desert. So the serpent appears twice, once in a negative connotation and once in a positive connotation. And that'll be important later on as well. Going up next from the, from the tailbone, we move up to the next chakra, and that's Vadhisthana. And this is the chakra that's located at the, the point of the sex organs themselves. This is depicted as a six petal lotus, or a ball of energy radiating in six directions, or six points of light. And it's said that we conquer death upon waking the chakra. When we develop the chakra, it basically gives us immortality in the spiritual realms. We're no longer, you know, born by the whole process of return and recurrence and that kind of stuff. So we conquer death upon awaking the chakra. He who meditates on this chakra never fears water and learns to command the elemental creatures of water. Developing this chakra would give you an unusual ability like being able to walk on water or being able to turn you know, water into wine, as an example. Okay, so the last chakra was giving us understanding and command of the element of earth. This one is giving us understanding and command of the element of water. Okay, the elemental creatures of the water, the intelligences behind water. It's called the Church of Smyrna in, Reverend, in the Book of Revelations. And it's in the Church of Smyrna that we conquer the water. We gain the knowledge of water and the use of that element. And it's interesting because our body is mostly water, right? 90% water, interestingly enough. So you see some connections there. The mantra is the letter M, and the color, you can think of it as like a brown color. Okay, so the, after the cosix, moving up the spinal column, the next one we get to is the sex organs, depicted as a six-petaled lotus, or energy streaming in six directions. And this is the chakra that's, uh, that's associated with the element of water, and command of the element of water. The next one is Manipura. And this is the solar plexus. This is your belly button. This is the chakra located in your belly button, and it corresponds to the digestive system and the pancreas. Okay, so the last one we looked at was, you know, the physical correlation is obviously the sex glands, and in particular in females, the ovaries, and the males, the testicles, related to the last chakra. This one we're looking at, the relation is the, the pancreas, the digestive system itself. Depicted as a ten-petaled lotus, or a ten-petaled flower. Now this chakra is interesting because this is our emotional antenna. We receive mental impressions of others through this chakra. It becomes our emotional antenna. We talked a little about this when we talked about the emotional center, right? That we gather a lot of information through the solar plexus. That also happens to correspond with where our umbilical cord used to be. We're able to receive all kinds of information through this particular chakra. It's our emotional antenna. When we fully develop that chakra, consequently, this is the one that gives us the power of telepathy, the ability to read other people's thoughts and communicate over distances. Okay, because this chakra is kind of like using it like a cell phone that you can use to call other people, for lack of a better term. It's a way that we can communicate mentally with other people through that particular chakra. Um, sometimes if we encounter uh, uh, spiritual beings or intelligences, they don't, nest, they don't speak like making the air move and you know, lips and that kind of stuff. Many times we encounter um, spiritual beings, they'll actually communicate to us mentally. We hear their voice in our mind. It's a, basically a type of telepathy. Mm -hmm. Working and developing the chakra allows us to do that. Um, the more we develop the chakra uh, through practice, and um, we'll look at different practices that allow us to do that over the course of the next few weeks, the more we'll be able to notice we get a better sense of what other people are thinking and feeling. We're just more receptive or open to other people's emotions. We can just read other people. 
Um, we're usually good at reading people that we're close to, like our significant other. We can tell when they're happy, sad, what kind of mood they're in, that kind of thing. But when we start developing this chakra, we can do that with other people as well. So we can be walking by a stranger on the street and just get a sense of, you know, that they're in a good mood or a bad mood or something happened and this is what happened and, you know, this is what they're going through. We're able just to, to read other people through this particular chakra. Another thing to mention as well, uh, we, I talked about how for the average person, most of these chakras aren't developed, they're atrophied. But sometimes as we go from lifetime to lifetime on a spiritual path, we can start to awaken different aspects. We can start to develop chakras that the next life are partially awoken. So that's why people sometimes have abilities like telepathy, like clairvoyance, because they're just carrying chakras that they've developed over the last few lifetimes. Okay, so people that have already certain abilities or faculties, it's because they've already been working on these chakras in a previous life. It might not be this life they're working on, that particular chakra, but that chakra is active from work they've done in previous lifetimes. And they might not even remember that, and they might not even be aware that they're, they're able to, to have this particular faculty because of the activity in this particular chakra. They just know they've always been an empath, they've been able to, to resonate and understand other people and read other people's minds, so to speak. Uh, we're free from any type of sickness when we learn to meditate on the chakra. So when we gain control over the chakra, which is a difficult thing to do, developing the chakras is not an overnight process, it's a, it's a lifetime of work, we're free from any type of sickness. So we're able to heal the physical body when we learn to meditate on the chakra. And being able to work with the chakra too allows us to be, to be healers, allows us to, to work with healing other people. This chakra is associated with fire. When we awaken the chakra, we never fear fire and will remain alive in the flames. So stories of great masters being able to, to walk through the flames, uh, fire walking is something associated with this particular chakra. Um, when we develop that chakra, when we gain the faculties of the chakra, then we learn to conquer the element of fire. It's the Church of Pergamos in the Book of Revelations. And in the Church of Pergamos, consequently, it's said that we conquer the fire. It has an associated sound, the mantra U, and its color is blue. And this one's easy to remember, because what sound would you make if somebody punched in the stomach and go, ooh, right? There's that sound right there. Ooh. That particular sound is associated with the solar plexus, the belly button, the chakra mind pura. And we can visualize it as a blue color, which I remember, because ooh and blue, they kind of rhyme. The next one we'll look at is the chakra Anahata, and that's the heart chakra. So we've gone from the tip of the, let's go up in a straight line, the tailbone, to the sex organs, to the solar plexus, now we're up to the heart. The heart is depicted as a 12-petaled flower, 12-petaled lotus. When meditating on the chakra, one can levitate. So if we're doing some intensive work on the chakra, if we're really developed in the use of the chakra, when we're meditating with it, we can actually start to levitate. So when we hear stories of people like St. Francis of Assisi in deep prayer, levitating, that's why he had this particular chakra developed. There's a story as well of uh, when the Chinese were occupying Tibet, of uh, the Chinese going into a Tibetan temple and seeing all the monks levitating. And the response was that was they panicked and they shot them all because they were, they were scared. But these particular group of monks had been working for an extended period of time with this particular chakra that allowed them to, to levitate, to float, while they were developing that. While that chakra was activating, it gave them the power of levitation. When one awakens this chakra, we command the winds and dissolve hurricanes. So we can see levitation, the idea of floating in the air, we see a correlation because this chakra is the one that's associated with the element of air itself. In the Book of Revelation, it's the Church of Tiatira. And in the Church of Tiatira, we conquer the air. So giving us command or control over the air element, which is why we see a levitation as a kind of a side effect, I guess you could call it, to developing and working with this particular chakra. And we look back a lot of the stories about some of the great masters and, and spiritual leaders, levitation regularly plays into that, as does things like walking on water and you know, walking on fire and not being burned and being able to hold hot objects, touch hot things and not burn themselves. It's all just related to different faculties 
that are developed through the awakening of different chakras. The mantra is O, and the color is red. I remember red because think of your heart, it's full of red stuff. I remember that. And we think of the mantra O. Now these mantras are interesting because when I go O, I feel that right here. O. When I go O, I feel that right there. So just closing your eyes and producing those sounds, you can identify where they are in your body because oh, that's not up here and it's not in here, it's, it's, it sits right there. And ooh, that's not up here, it's not anywhere up there, it's actually lower, it's in the solar plexus. So these mantras, these sounds are interesting because you can physically feel that area of your body vibrating at that point. And that's why we have these particular sounds. And that'll make more sense in a few minutes when we look at the idea of, of mantras. The next one is Vishuddha, and that's the, the larynx chakra. That's the one that corresponds with our thyroid gland, so the one that's right here in the larynx. So we'll just keep going up in a straight line from the tailbone to the sex organs to the solar plexus to the heart and now to the larynx. We picked it as a 16 petaled flower, and whoever meditates on and awakens the chakra can know the highest knowledge of all the sacred books and is capable of knowing the past present and the future. Okay, so we, one of the aspects that we develop when working with the chakra is we're able to, to know a lot of things. We're able to understand a lot of the sacred knowledge. Because right now we can read some of those sacred books. We can read things like the Bhagavad Gita or the Quran or the Bible. And, you know, humanity spends thousands of years fighting over what those words mean. Okay, but when we awaken the chakra, when we develop that faculty, we can really understand the sacred teaching. We can really grasp some of the knowledge that's in there, as well as understanding the relationship between the past, the present, and the future. This chakra gives us the power of clairaudience. Clairaudience is the ability to hear into the higher dimensions. That's why working on practices that develop this chakra, it's not unusual to hear things. Okay, if you're working on a particular meditation that is, is activating or developing this chakra, it's not unusual for you to hear all kinds of strange things. One of the most disconcerting things that ever happened to me was in the middle of a meditation, somebody said my name right here beside, which really, you know, brought me to the meditation really quick and made me panic and, and look around. All it was doing was activating the ability of clear audience for a second. I was able to hear into the higher dimensions. And it's not unusual to, to have all kinds of... You might be familiar with the idea of meditating and seeing a vision or seeing an image. You can also hear something as well. You can hear a voice or a message or a word or, or something like that. That's related with that particular chakra. Remember, the, when we think of things dimensionally, we tend to think of dimensions being one on top of the other. What we have to remember is the dimensions are all around us. Right now in this room, all seven dimensions are interpenetrating each other. We just have senses that are tuned into the information of the physical. Through manipulating the chakras in meditation, we can learn to tune our receiver into the different dimensions. To see, to hear, to perceive all the stuff that's happening in those different dimensions. Kind of like just you know, having a radio and tuning it to a different station. It's the same idea. All the radio waves for every cell phone and radio station all over the place are bombarding us right now. The only ones that we hear are whatever the receiver's tuned to. Through meditation and developing the chakras, we can learn to tune into different aspects of the higher dimensions. In this case, we'd be tuning into sounds of the higher dimensions. Now this is an interesting chakra because it's related with the creative word. Developing this chakra allows us to incarnate the verb and create with our voice, which is a really interesting thing. When we look, um, kind of a bad example, when we look at somebody like Adolf Hitler, he spoke, millions of people listened. I mean, if you've ever seen uh, videos of his, him speaking or him talking, he was a very motivating, very powerful speaker. There's all kinds of people on our planet like that. These are people that have abilities developed with this particular chakra. Adolf Hitler problem was he was on a spiritual path, he was working with a lot of these techniques, but he didn't eliminate the ego. So he had abilities that was used by the ego. In this case, he was, you know, 
responsible for all kinds of horrible atrocities. But people who are generally powerful and captivating speakers have some sort of a, a latent ability in the chakra from previous existences or they're trying to activate it. Basically it allows us to bring forth creation with our voice. And that relates to the quote that we looked at in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. That's related with this particular aspect. And in the higher dimensions, which we'll talk about later on, the intelligences that reside there, the angels, the divinities, they literally create through word. It's like a form of action. Sound actually creates, and the things that happen there crystallize down into the physical. It's the Church of Sardis in the Book of Revelation. And in the Church of Sardis, we conquer the Akashic fluids. You can think of that as the fifth element. You've got the fire, earth, air, water, and then we've got akasha. It's sometimes referred to as spirit, so fire, earth, air, water, spirit. Uh, but in this aspect we're talking about the akashic fluids. It's the, the, the fifth element, the element that we don't really physically see, but it's the element that it's, every, it's all around us, it's tied into everything around us. It's just not tangible like fire, earth, air, and water. The mantra is the letter E, and the color is green. Now, We'll just quickly talk a little bit about uh, some, some interesting things in language. In English, we say this is an E, right? We say that's the letter E, and we say this is the letter I. Now, in every other language on the planet, this is not E, and this is not I. This is A, and this is E. Okay? So this would be E is in ski. Okay? And this would be A as in, think of something like way, okay? Um, most of the, the classical languages, all the languages uh, that are related to Latin, which of course Spanish would be a good example, but also Slavic languages and Pol Pol Polish and all kinds of stuff. This is A and this is E. Us English speaking, we're weird. We stand out on the planet by saying <coughs> this is E and we just call this I, which is totally something different altogether. Okay, so when we see this, what I'm talking about here, this is the mantra, because well, that's right there, right where it's supposed to be. Okay, E is something else altogether. So A is in way. You know how I remember this? Because I think of being Canadian. Eh? I think of it like that. Okay, so if that's A, and this is E, is in ski. Okay, think of it that way. Okay, so that's. So it's kind of something weird, and it's, it's something that um, when you first work with the different mantras, is you have a hard time remembering when you see things that this is pronounced the A and this is pronounced the E. And that's just us English people. The rest of the world is totally fine because we're the ones that do it wrong. And its color is green. And I think it would be E and the green. Excuse me, you say Akashic fluids. Mm -hmm. Is that related to the Akashic records that we have? Yeah, if you think of the Akashic fluids, um, if, let's kind of think of the Akashic fluids like, like magnetic, magnetic tape, like cassette tape. And everything that happens creates an imprint on that tape that later on you could go and you could play back. Just like when you're recording something on a, on a VHS tape or a cassette tape, you have a medium that records all these magnetic impulses that you can then play back and look at later. Everything that happens makes an impression in the Akasha, okay, in the Akashic fluids, which then you can go back and look at. I think the Akashic fluids is like a giant tape that's been recording for you know millions of years, recording everything that happens. And by um, look at later on some meditati meditation techniques to do this, but we can go and look at the Akashic records. Think of the Akashic records like the internet or the libraries of the higher dimensions. That we can go access this technology and use um, the Akashic fluids to see what's happened at various points. So we can explore our past lives in the Akashic Records. We can explore different uh, races of humanity in the Akashic Records, different points in the Earth's development in the Akashic Records. But think of it like a magnetic tape where everything that happens creates an impression. And that impression can be then played back later on. That's what the Akashic Records are kind of like. Uh, the next chakra is Ajna. And that's the pineal gland. That's the third eye. That's the, the famous brow chakra, the one that sits right there. So we've gone from the cosex of the tailbone, the sex organs. We've gone from the solar plexus, the heart, the thyroid. Now we're right at the third eye, the pineal gland. It's seen as a two-headed lotus. 
And awakening this chakra, this is the one that most we're familiar with, gives us the power of clairvoyance. That's why it's called the third eye. Opening that chakra allows us to see into the higher dimensions, tune our sense of sight into the higher dimensions. Working with mantras that develop this chakra, that's why sometimes in a meditation we'll get a vision of something or we'll see something. Okay, and it's not unusual to be, you know, just experimenting with meditation and being in a state of meditation and suddenly get an image that comes out of nowhere. Not just something fuzzy, but a clear picture of something. And over time, we can take those brief flashing images and we can turn them into to a lot longer state and then finally start interacting with astral projection and all that kind of stuff. It's the Church of Philadelphia. And in the Church of Philadelphia, we conquer the mind which is, as we know, a very difficult thing to do, to gain control over our own minds, finally enough. The mantra is E, not I, E, and its color is yellow. And I think of E and Y, I kind of remember it that way. So you've got red, you've got green, and you've got yellow. Kind of think of them like a stoplight out of order, if that helps at all. And in the end, you don't need to get too hung up on the colors. It's not really important to understand the colors. It doesn't really matter that much. It's just like a, a minor detail at this point in what colors they are. Next one is Sahasrara, and this is the crown chakra, the one that we see on the top of the head. And the physical association with this is the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland, it's like the master gland of the endocrine system. The pituitary gland secretes hormones that control all the other glands in our body. Okay, so the pituitary gland is like the master gland. Uh, Sahasrara is like the master chakra. It's the crown chakra. Okay, it's the one that, that sits on the top of our head. You can think of it half in your head, half out of your head. And this is the crown of the saints. It's this chakra that the activation of this chakra is why religious figures were always depicted with halos. Okay, because those halos related to the, the energy, the light emitted from this particular chakra. When higher intelligences, when beings from the higher dimensions manifested or allowed themselves to be seen by humans at various states of consciousness, sometimes physically appearing to humans, sometimes appearing in the higher dimensions, those saints, those religious people, those angels, whatever you want to call them, would always be seen with a crown of light emanating from their head. That's the energy radiating from this particular chakra because those beings in the higher dimensions, they've awoken these energy centers, okay? They have these energy centers active. So when we have an experience with an entity from a higher dimension, we often see this, this light streaming from their head. I'm a really bad artist, but... We go back to the, the heart chakra. Remember the heart chakra, how many petals did it have? It had two petals, right? So imagine this. Here's, 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 <laughs> here's a stick man, because this is how good I am an artist. There's a stick person, okay? And this stick person has light emanating from this particular chakra on their head, and they have two streams of light emanating either side of their heart chakra. What does that look like? Wings, right? Wings and a halo. That's why angels are always seen as wings with a halo, because you're just seeing or sensing the energy coming out of those particular energy centers, those chakras. Okay, so the energy radiating from the heart chakra in two directions formed luminous wings, wings of light, and the energy radiating from the head gave them um, a crown of light, which is why angels had wings and halos. That's where wings and halos come from. Uh, seen as a thousand petal lotus. Have you ever seen a picture of, or, or a depiction of Buddha? He's got this head, or this little hat that has all these little dots on it. That's his crown chakra. That's his thousand petal, or his, his crown of a thousand jewels that sits on his head. That's just a depiction of his uh, crown chakra being developed. Uh, when awoken, it gives us the power of intuition, which is a, a basically intuition allows us to receive information other than through the senses. So right now, everything that you know has to be something that you've learned, uh, something that you've developed, or something that you've attained through either sight, sound, taste, touch, or smell, right? Every experience you have is a memory of some combination of those senses. Intuition, the definition of intuition, is information that reaches our consciousness that we didn't gather through the five senses. If you were known something but have no idea why you know it, you just know it, that's intuition. If you ever had a hunch, you're like, I don't know why, I just, I feel this is the right thing to do, or I feel this is the wrong thing to do. I can't 
can't say why, I can't really describe it, it's just a feeling, that's intuition. One of the reasons why we wrestle with intuition is because we're so programmed to gathering information through the five senses. When our higher self speaks to us through the sense of intuition, it's almost confusing because we don't know why. We try to override that with reason and logic, but we have a really hard time doing that because it's information that's just arrived at our consciousness that's been gathered some way other than the five senses. It's the Church of Laodicea, and in the Church of Laodicea, we conquer the light, the spiritual light. Uh, interestingly enough, there's no mantra for this, because this is something that we can't actually develop. This is, there's no point trying to meditate on this chakra. This one is developed after all the others are awoken. So once all the other chakras are awoken, this one then happens spontaneously. So you won't find a, a particular practice for trying to meditate or develop the chakra, because this chakra can't happen until all the other ones have developed. Once all the other ones have developed, then this chakra is able to open. This is like the master chakra that needs all the other ones uh, first to be open before this one can activate. So you don't see any practices. You see practices to develop the heart chakra. You see practices to develop the third eye for clairvoyance and that kind of thing. But you don't see practices for developing the crown chakra. Uh, here's some pictures of saints. Uh, there, this is a, a depiction of, of, the, uh, of the disciples. They've got the, the crown of light around them. Uh, here's Buddha. He's got the same crown of light. Uh, here's everybody's, uh, Jesus, obviously, crown of light. Here's Krishna, crown of light. Um, here's Horus, uh, crown of light. So here you go. That's the same concept. You've got a couple thousands of years of civilization spread thousands of kilometers around the globe. Why are they all depicting their religious figures with the same symbols on their head? Okay, because it's related with the chakra, the energy of that particular center. When the ancient people saw these masters, that's what they saw. They saw discs and crowns of light as the energy was radiating from that particular chakra. So that's how they drew them. That's how they depicted them. Everything from Christianity to Buddhism. Um, there's Krishna sitting right there. And even the Egyptian mythology as well, depicting the same kind of concept, a disc of light over their head. Um, any questions about the chakras? Chakras is something we keep talking about all the time. This is, you think this is a basic introduction to chakras, but we'll look at this more and more. Yes? Uh, when working on chakras mm -hmm. and uh, attempting to awaken them, is it it's preferable to uh, start at the base of the chakra and work your way up? Not, it depends on what we're trying to develop. Um, if we're trying to go for the awakening of the Kundalini, which is what we need to develop the solar bodies, we'll talk about that aspect later on, then we work from the bottom up because the Kundalini has to rise from the cosics all the way to the top of the head. But if you're trying to do something like just develop the heart chakra, you can just go straight to that one. Okay, if you want to work on uh, uh, being able to, to use the third eye to see into the higher dimensions, you can work on just that one. So you can pick individual chakras but that type of meditation will only temporarily develop the chakra. If we want to fully develop and permanently develop the chakras, we have to do that by the awakening of kundalini and raising the kundalini energy from the cosics all the way to the brain. Um, and that's a totally different practice, and we'll get into that later on. Because by raising the kundalini, we will permanently awaken each chakra as the kundalini rises. But through meditation, we can temporarily open a chakra to gain access to particular faculties. So through meditation on the third eye, we can open that chakra to gain a vision about something, perhaps to the solution to a problem we're seeking or something like that. So you can target individual chakras, but ideally that the ultimate goal is to awaken them all permanently by developing the kundalini, and there's very specific practices just for that aspect. So yes to both of your questions. Do you go all in order or you can pick individual ones? Mm -hmm. It depends what you're trying to do. It depends on the goal of the meditation and the practices. I did not pay attention. This one has any color or... Uh, 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 not color, it's just seen as a, basically a brilliant white light. Um, it's just seen as a, a light that's... Um, people that have had experiences with angels and, and divinities from higher dimensions, it's just a, a brilliant white light. It's almost a blinding white light, and sometimes you can't even actually see the, the, the outlines of the face or features of whatever. It's just the light that you're, you're getting uh, bathed in. Now, when we look at mantras themselves, they originated in India with Hinduism. Uh, I like to know where words come from. You haven't that already. Uh, the word mantra itself, it's, it's a compound word that comes from a Sanskrit word of root, 
a, sorry, a Sanskrit root word of man, which means to think, and the suffix tra, which means tool. So a mantra becomes a thinking tool or an instrument of thought. Okay, so mantras are things that we use for meditation. The things that we use to gain control over the mind, to silence the intellectual center and the endless train of thought. Okay, so we're looking at a root word of mon, to think, and tra, tool. So a thinking tool or instrument of thought. Mantras themselves, they just become combinations of sounds which selectively vibrate and activate chakras for certain purposes. Okay? Each chakra, as we saw, has a resonant frequency, a sound associated with it. Producing that sound allows us to direct energy at that chakra. Okay? Directing energy at the chakra is basically feeding the chakra, giving it fuel, in an attempt to, to jumpstart it. You can kind of think of it that way. The mantras are just combinations of sounds which supply energy to particular chakras in a set order to create a specific purpose. Okay, so we have mantras for astral projection. We have mantras for remembering our past lives, as an example. We have mantras for awakening the Kundalini. Okay, different combinations of sounds which feed energy to the chakras in a certain way for a specific purpose. Okay, you can think of a mantra as, as a word of power. That's something that's always been a part of any kind of esoteric path. Okay, chanting is a mantra. Okay, uh, uh, looking at the magic spells, saying certain words, they're just mantras. They're, they're words that have a specific combination of sounds that create an effect in our environment. Not only affecting the environment around us, but also affecting our bodies, our chakras, and states of consciousness as well. Okay, you can also just call a mantra a wise combination of letters whose sounds determine spiritual, psychic, and also physical effects. Okay, so when we do, when we do a, chant, a chant, when we work in a particular mantra, it's a combination of sounds that change. It changes our physical environment, it changes our mind and levels of consciousness, but it also changes what's happening spiritually in the higher bodies. Okay, because remember all the dimensions all around us. When I make a sound in one dimension, it's affecting the other ones. Okay, it's not like the higher dimensions are somewhere far away. They're all right here. When I make a sound, when I work with a mantra, I'm creating something that happens in those other dimensions as well. The sound just doesn't stop in the physical dimension. Sound is a type of energy. And energy is something that can travel from one dimension to another. Mantras and other words of power are sounds that when vocalized cause certain areas of our physical bodies or brains to resonate and vibrate. Okay, and because all the bodies are connected to each other, because the organs are connected to chakras that are connected to other chakras, that vibration, that energy, is able to travel from one point to another. Okay, so we have to start thinking of, you know, sound as being something that's, that's a lot more complicated. It's not just, you know, something that we hear. Sound is a type of energy. Okay, directing energy at certain chakras can cause them to awaken and develop. Each chakra has a resonant frequency which is associated with a particular sound. We looked at that already. Due to resonance, producing the sound will cause the chakra to vibrate and activate because of the supplied energy. Mantras are a way to jumpstart or kickstart a chakra. Okay, just like if your car battery died, you needed to supply some sort of external energy. So you get another car, you plug it in, and then you boost that battery. Working with a mantra is like a way of, of, of giving us, or giving the chakras a jump start or a boost. Because as we pronounce the mantra, we're directing energy at a specific frequency at the chakra. And over time, the more we do the mantra, the more we feed energy to that chakra, the more that chakra begins to grow, develop, and awaken. <clears throat> producing the sounds of the mantra, the whole purpose we do that is we use the sound to focus and direct the energy to the chakra. The sound just becomes the, the method of conveyance for that energy transfer. With practice over time, the chakras develop and awaken. Obviously, if you only do the sound a little bit, you're not really focusing energy. But if you, over time, keep practicing the particular mantra, keep meditating with the mantra, you will awaken that chakra. You will start to develop it. The resonant frequencies correspond to what we refer to as the seven sacred vowel sounds. 
Okay, E A O U R M and S. And these are interesting in that these are the only letters that you can sustain. Okay, these letters are interesting. So I can go E and do that till I run out of breath. A O U R M S. You, these are the only letters you can sustain. Think of the letter like uh, X. Uh, you can't sustain X. You can't B, well that becomes E. C becomes E. K becomes A. Okay, these are the sustained sounds. These are really interesting, the seven sacred vowel sounds. They're said to resonate in all of creation. What's the deal with the letter seven? Everything seven, seven chakras, seven vowel sounds, seven colors, seven in the seven uh, notes in the octave, se everything seven, 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 seven is all over the Bible. There's something called the law of heptaparaparshanuk. Okay, that's a crazy complicated word. It means law of seven. Okay? <laughs> think, of, think of hepta like a heptagram. That's the, the root for seven. The heptaparaparshanuk, the law of the seven. Now, the power of three create, and the power of three, the three is the positive, the negative, the neutral. If you're a Christian, you'd call that Father, Son, Holy Spirit. If you're an Egyptian, you call that Isis, Osiris, and Horus. Okay, Brahma, Shiva, Vishnu. Okay, with always the Trinity, for lack of a term, positive, negative, and neutral. Okay, and we see that depicted in the Hebrew Tree of Life by the top three spheral. Okay, positive, negative, and neutral. The power three create, but the law of seven organize. Okay, so that's why we see seven archangels. Okay, that's why we see seven even in our music scale. Okay, seven. Uh, Notes in a music scale, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Okay. <coughs> the power of three create, the law of seven organize. Seven plus three give us ten. Okay, the power of three create, the law of seven organize. So that's why we see three and seven everywhere. It's like three and seven are like God's fingerprints, for lack of a better term. Everything that was created is touched or influenced by three or seven because we've got the three forces that create, and we've got the seven that give structure and organize things. Okay, so that's why we've got the seven archangels seen, being seen as responsible for all of creation. Okay, so the heptaparaparshanuk is the law of seven. So that's why seven and three are big numbers that appear all over the place. Let's just quickly go back and look at sound. Um, sound is energy caused by vibration or movement of an object. Um, this is kind of an interesting thing for me because a bit of uh, when we look at the different, you know, where we have the three brains, we have the thinkers, the feelers, and the doers, the emotional, the motor instinctive, and the intellectual. I find myself leaning towards the intellectual uh, category. And during the day, I actually teach uh, a, a college course on acoustics. And acoustics is all about the physical sound. This is this weird overlap for me because acoustics of sound, this is how I got into esoteric stuff by studying some really unique and interesting properties of sound and sound's effects on the physiology or physiology of the mind and psychoacoustics and all this other stuff, there was a strong connection to me between physics and many esoteric things. And when I saw things like mantras and people you know, talking about chanting and different things that happen as you do that, I was able to see some real physical principles coming into play. Sound is energy caused by vibration or movement of an object. Sound is energy. It's a way for energy to move from one point to another. Right now, I'm producing energy that's hitting your eardrums, okay? There's a transference of energy that's occurring there. Okay, so think of sound as the transference of energy from point A to point B, a source to a listener. All energy, everything in creation, is just different rates of vibration. Light is a different rate of vibration. It's a type of energy. So is X-rays, gamma rays, radio waves. Everything is just vibration at different frequencies. You can break the frequency spectrum and go all the way from, you know, infrared and subsonic and go all the way to light. And it's all just different rates of, rates of vibration. It's all just different frequencies. That's why you might have heard people say things like matter doesn't actually exist. Matter is just an illusion. The only thing that exists is energy at different forms of vibration. Okay, that chair feels hard to you right now because the energy of your butt and the energy of the chair are actually repelling each other. The fact that the chair is hard is a total illusion. It's just a different repulsion of energy. Everything that exists is just energy in one form or another. So is sound. 
every object or structure has a frequency which it wants to vibrate at. This is a really interesting uh, property of physics. This isn't even esoteric stuff. This is just regular basic physics. Everything has a particular frequency that it wants to vibrate at. We call that the resonant frequency. Okay, everything has a resonant frequency. Our physical bodies, this house, that our computer stand, the chakras, everything has a resonant frequency. Something really weird happens when you introduce energy or sound to an object that's equal to the resonant frequency of that object. So if I take an object that has a resonant frequency, and if I produce sound that's equal to that resonant frequency, I force that object to vibrate. I force it into vibration. Okay, that's how we can use sound to make things vibrate, make things move. That's how we can use sound to jumpstart the chakras through this process of resonance and sympathetic vibration. Okay, the old experiment for this was two tuning forks close to each other. You set one tuning fork off, bring it beside another one, that one will start to vibrate as well. Or two pianos really close to each other. You hit a note on one piano that's close to another one, you have a listen, that piano is vibrating along with it as well. The classic example of this was the opera singer shattering a glass with her voice. That's resonant synthetic vibration. Loud music, when there's some you know, kids drive by in a, in a souped up car with a big stereo, that's why the stuff in your cupboards rattle. Uh, in medicine, we use it to destroy kidney stones, using ultrasound to break up kidney stones, and they think that the walls of Jericho, the story of the walls of Jericho falling down with the trumpet glass in the Bible, is related to resonance and sympathetic vibration as well. So sound is something that we take for granted, but sound is a very powerful force that we can use it to harness and do all kinds of strange things with it. Uh, in the 1950s, the U.S. military studied something called black sound, which was using sound as a weapon. You can use sound to do very nasty things to the human body. Um, different frequencies of sound do all kinds of strange things to our psychology. There are set frequencies of sound that I could produce with the right equipment that would make you feel very uncomfortable, make you feel very afraid, make you feel like there's a presence in the room. Oftentimes those sounds are mixed into the soundtracks of horror movies, on haunted houses and fair rides and stuff like that, right? So sounds has all kinds of really strange effects to us. Sounds that we find displeasing, loud sounds, they not only damage our hearing, but they also cause us to release stress chemicals in our body. Okay, so our, the sounds around us can do all kinds of strange things to our psychology, both physiologically and uh, mentally as well, psychologically. So we have to remember that sound not only affects the physical, but other dimensions as well, because sound is a type of energy. It's energy that's basically all around us. And by using our mouth, we can create different sounds that produce various effects in the physical, also in our mind, also in the chakras and the bodies that we possess in the other dimensions, because everything's connected that way. Okay, sound is energy, energy can create or destroy, which is kind of an interesting aspect. And that's why when we go back to the beginning of the class, we talked about in the beginning, the word was with God, that whole quote was about God and sound. That whole quote was about God bringing all of creation by use of his voice, by use of sound. Okay, so that's why when we look at different esoteric paths, prayer and words of power and spells and chants and chakras and mantras, they've always been related. Sound has always been a really important part of spirituality or religion or whatever you want to call it. Words create, and this is a, this is a, a quote. One should never condemn anyone with a word because one should never judge anyone. Slander, gossip, and lies have filled the world with pain and bitterness. And that's something really important to, re to, to remember. Um, actually, if you go back to ancient Jewish law, uh, slander, gossip, and lying was seen on par with rape and murder. Because they were all seen as having equally horrendous opportunities. So you could destroy somebody's life. You could ruin somebody's livelihood and their ability to feed their families and all that kinds of stuff by slandering, by lying about them, by, by gossiping about them. Which is why to the, the ancient Jewish people, that was just as bad as murdering somebody. Or just as bad as raping somebody. We kind of think nothing about this. We gossip, slander, and lie many times during the day at work. You see it around you all the time. Nobody thinks about this kind of stuff anymore. Interestingly enough, one of the biggest ways we acquire and accrue karma for ourselves is with our voice. 
So we can either create something positive with our voice, or we can do negative things with our voice. The negative things that we do is create uh, the karma by talking about other people, by lying, by saying things, by spreading gossip and that kind of stuff. So we have to remember this, not to condemn anyone with a word. We can create, our voice can change other people's perceptions. It can change the lives of those around us. But we forget that, so we never really watch what we say. It's so easy to talk and talk and talk without ever remembering what the effects of those words are. What happens when that sound reaches people's ears and it changes their impression of situations and events and people? Those sounds are things that we're responsible for. Just like we looked at, you know, the, the, the wake a boat makes when it travels through the water and those waves ripple out, our voice ripples out into the world. So we have to remember that we shouldn't be slander, slandering, gossiping, and, and lying about people because that's something that accrues karma for us. That's something that we have to be responsible for at some point. This is another quote by Master Samael. The characteristics of the world change when our psychic organism changes. The chakras, the senses, everything that we have, these are ways that we use to look at the world. These are the ways that we gather information. When we change the way that we gather information, when we change the way that we perceive things, then we change the world around us. We change our perception of the world. The development of the chakras makes the world change for the initiate. Okay, so the whole concept of be the change that you want to see, when we start developing with the chakras and we start awakening faculties like clairvoyance and intuition and that kind of thing, we start changing our own reality. We start perceiving a different reality around us. We start perceiving things in the higher dimensions and all that kind of stuff. And it really changes the way that we look at the world. Even something simple like doing a meditation and hearing somebody call your name right beside you here, that, oops, that changes the way that you look at things, that changes the way that you look at the world.